When I first got into the custom keyboard hobby, one of my dream keyboards was the QK65. I saw all of my favorite content creators talk about the thocky sound it produced and the quality of the materials you get for such a competitive price. Finally, today, I have the QK65 V2 Classic, a 65% board from Critty Keys starting at $155 before shipping. Let's see if it lives up to the original QK65. Inside the case, we have a lot of accessories. Here we have some plate and PE foam, as well as the PCB. Mine is the non-flex cut ANSI PCB, which comes in at a standard 1.6mm thick and features VIA and QMK compatibility. It also supports the Sangin bottom row with a 7U spacebar and some other cool layout stuff which we love to see. Something I'm really happy to see is the utilization of the magnetic connector we saw on the Neo 70 and Neo 80. This little guy makes assembly so much easier and eliminates the need for a JST to connect to the dotty board. QK offers a few different PCB options including one that supports magnetic switches. QK sent me two plates. One is palm and the other is aluminum, so we'll be able to see how this board sounds with both. I appreciate the lack of flex cuts on both of the plates. Here we have the included Neo stabs. I quite like these as they're fairly simple to install and are easy to tune. Finally, we have the case. In it, there's a couple different case foam layers. My unit has a copper weight, a gold bottom case, and an anodized black top case. Altogether, it makes a super clean and elegant looking case, and the finishes are smooth and completely flawless. The silhouette of the case is rather simple, but on the back, there are some interesting edges that are visible with direct light. One of the edges continues around the whole case and is visible from the side and front, giving it some design. In the middle of the rear weight, there's a slot for a magnet to attach, which has become kind of a trademark for a lot of QK boards. Mine is the blank version. On the inside of the bottom case, there's a brushed stainless steel weight that covers the two batteries powering the Bluetooth and 2.4GHz wireless connectivity. In addition to the case, there's a separate box of accessories. There's a ton of stuff like a 2.4GHz dongle, gaskets, screws, alternate colored feet, extra clips for the case, the magnetic badge for the back of the case, an extra ribbon cable, keycap and switch pullers, a rather fancy screwdriver, and finally a coiled cable that looks surprisingly good. One of the cool features of this board is how the top and bottom cases interlock with each other. The top case has these plastic clips that you can access under the rear feet, which is convenient for taking apart and assembling the case, but I will admit it feels slightly cheap compared to something like screws or even the ball catch system we saw on the Neo 80. I'm glad that they included extra clips just in case though. The bottom case has these little foam things that act as force brake stickers. I found that they helped reduce the metal on metal ping a whole lot. Alright, let's move on to the build. I have the Neo stabs installed on the PCB, and they're lubed with 205G0 on the housings and dielectric grease on the wires. In this sequence, I have the PCB dumbbell gaskets installed, but I will have a sound test using the top mount as well. Here we have our plate foam, and on goes the plate. As you can see, I'm installing the palm plate, but I'll have aluminum plate sound test as well. For switches, I'm using Akko V3 cream yellows, hand lubed with 205G0. These are super smooth and they complement the sound of the board well. For top mount configurations, you'd screw the plate into the top case first, but since I'm using the gaskets in this clip, the PCB just drops into the bottom case. On goes our top case, which I just press down and it clips in. Finally, for keycaps, I'm using my trusty Akko black and pink dancer keycaps. They're double shot PBT cherry profile keycaps from Echo, and they have great layout support. I'm super happy with how the board looks, but now let's hear how it sounds in a couple different configurations.
Okay, so this board sounds a little too good. I remember when the original QK65 came out, and it sounded insane with foams, but pretty thin and dull without. In this version, it sounds insanely good with just plate foam, and I'm sure it sounds great even without it. With the palm plate, the sound is on the clackier side, and it has a wonderful pop which you normally don't find on most boards. On the other side of the spectrum, the second configuration is a more classic setup with an aluminum plate and top mount. I thought this configuration would end up sounding hollow and dull, but it ended up exceeding my expectations, with the signature clacky and dry sound associated with top mount keyboards. It didn't sound hollow at all, and it almost felt like a board designed for top mount despite it supporting gasket mount as well. The final configuration with the aluminum plate and gasket mount also sounded insanely good, with slightly sharper alphas and a more aggressive spacebar. One thing I appreciate QK doing is avoiding mounting points under the spacebar. This keeps the spacebar from feeling too stiff and allows it to sound really good. Overall, the sound is much better than I initially expected and it sounds significantly better with minimal foam than the original QK65. In terms of feel, the board is very average, with a decent amount of gasket compression, but not a whole lot of assembly flex. So what do I think of this board? Well, I wasn't a huge fan of the QK65 V2 and its screen, but I'm happy to say that the classic version is one of my favorite boards to date, and I would highly recommend it to someone looking for a board with slightly more features than the Neo 65. However, if you're looking to save a little bit of money, the Neo 65 and Neo 70 are both amazing options as well. Anyway, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you for watching, and thank you QWERTY Keys for sending out the board. See you guys later. Bye!